Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today as we continue NACL's 2021 webinar series. Today, we're excited to have partnered with the Ernest Becker Foundation to bring you this webinar exploring death, anxiety, and police culture. Although many of you are familiar with the work NACL does throughout the year, for those of you who are not, NACL is an organization that for the last 26 years has worked to create a community of support for independent civilian oversight entities that seek to make their local law enforcement agencies, jails, and prisons more transparent, accountable, and responsive to the communities they serve. For more information about NACL, training opportunities, and resources, please visit our website at nacol.org. Before we begin today's webinar, I'd like to to remind all of you that you have entered today's call in listen-only mode. During the session, however, you will have the ability to type in the questions that you have. We will then post those questions to our speakers towards the end of the session. I would like to also remind you that today's meeting is being recorded and will be made available at a later date. And now I'd like to turn it over to Brian Corr, the Executive Se Secretary for the City of Cambridge's Police Advisory Review and Review Board. In addition, Brian serves as the immediate past president of NACL. Brian? All right, thank you, Cami. And thank you to everyone who is here on this webinar. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to moderate this today. And I really wanna thank um, our panelists and presenters. And I will say a bit about them in just one second, but please do know that NACL is an organization that is devoted to supporting and improving law enforcement policing around the country and really around the world. And so to be able to have this discussion today is so timely as we do this work. So my role is really just to introduce our panelists, kind of keep the conversation going and work a little bit on the questions at the end. So we will have an opportunity to hear from each of our panelists for a few minutes. And then after that, we will um, get into some conversation and Q&A and know that we will have hopefully uh, about 30 minutes at the end for Q&A. So we're going to really try to balance content with an opportunity for all of you to ask your questions and to hear your voices virtually, as it were, through the questions. So having said that, I want to start by introducing Deborah Jacobs, who is the organizer of this. Deborah is a, a longtime friend and colleague. She is the executive director of the Ernest Becker Foundation, and you'll hear more about that in a bit. But she also has worked as executive director um, at ACLU chapters in multiple states in New Jersey. She's worked in Missouri, and she spent uh, a number of years as the uh, person doing civilian oversight for King County. Washington. So that's the county where Seattle is and many other suburbs. So Deborah is a friend and an incredible colleague and very passionate about this work. So I'm glad to be able to introduce her. Um, I also want to introduce Sheldon Solomon, who is a professor at Skidmore University. Again, you can read about people's official bios, but I will say that Sheldon was actually Deborah's professor in college. And part of the reason she does the work that she does is because of the collaboration that they did while she was a student. And uh, Professor Solomon has been doing work for decades on the connection between fear and terror and how that affects people's behavior. And so, uh, we will be hearing from him as well and looking forward to that presentation. And then, of course, we have last but certainly not least, uh, John Mascali, who is a professor in North Dakota, but has worked in many different places and has done really, really interesting work in writing and research on issues of police training, on body war cameras, on officer involved shootings, on intimate partner violence. But all of these within this context of looking at the role of death, anxiety, fear, and terror, and how it affects behavior in ways that we're often not conscious of. So with that, with no further ado, I want to hand it over to Deborah Jacobs to start off our discussion. Deborah? Thank you so much, Brian. Um, greetings to all. For those of you who know me from the ACLU or from police oversight, you may also know that I've had a number of side passions over the years and one of them is spreading the word about the influence of fear of death on our behavior. I think that what we're going to learn today will prove valuable not only in your police accountability work, but also in your individual lives. For me, 
coming to understand the role of death anxiety in my life has allowed me to have more intentionality in understanding what's happening to me internally when I make a snap judgment or respond negatively to something without any obvious reasons. I've really found it a tremendous tool for mindfulness. So perhaps that's one other potential takeaway for today. But the centerpiece is really focusing on sort of how the fear of death affects the behavior of police in particular. And you might wonder why are we talking about their psychology when we have a traumatized and wounded community that's been victimized by police. And I, I think for me, the reason is that uh, as long as police are patrolling our streets and they're in an armed capacity, we have to understand that their mental well-being is directly correlated to the health and safety of the community. And so that is one reason for the focus today. The bottom line is that um, our, our health and safety are entangled with those of the, those who serve as law enforcement. But in fact, the ideas that we're gonna to discuss today apply to every single one of us. And when it's time, I welcome you to ask our experts about community impacts from death anxiety, the pervasive fear of death that is um, disproportionately upon minority communities, communities of color, et cetera. So that's a little context for what we're talking about and what some of the takeaways might be. To introduce the Ernest Becker Foundation, I do want to mention I'm a longtime volunteer leader with the Ernest Becker Foundation. I've been doing this work in some capacity uh, since the 90s, I think. Um, Ernest Becker was a cultural anthropologist who researched and wrote about how we reckon with our mortality and the effects that the knowledge of our mortality has on us. That's kind of the nutshell of what he did. He died in 1974 prematurely. He was only 49, but um, that same year, posthumously, he won the Pulitzer Prize for his work called The Denial of Death. Um, in 1993, the Ernest Becker Foundation was founded by a retired Seattle physician named Dr. Neil Elgie, who we just lost last year. And his goal was to spread the word of Becker and continue applying Becker's ideas to modern society. And that's what we do at the Ernest Becker Foundation. You can check out our website. We have um, just put up a feature in the last couple of days about death denial and uh, racial justice that looks a lot of the issues we'll be touching on today as well. Um, Today, the Ernest Becker Foundation is trying to bring the lens of death anxiety to social issues of our times, especially those that evoke um, reminders of our mortality, police practices certainly being one of them, but also the death penalty, reproductive rights, immigration, gun safety, many other issues. So that's sort of what we're doing. And we're so thrilled to partner with NACOL and appreciate the opportunity to um, have some of this knowledge touch your world a little bit. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Becker's synthesis. Um, I'm not calling it Becker's theories or theory. We call it a synthesis because what Becker did is he pulled thought and theory and ideas from many other thinkers before him Ronk, Kierkegaard, Marx, Frankel, Aristotle, Tolstoy. There's a huge list. He was a voracious reader and heavily influenced by those before him. So his central ideas we call a synthesis because it pulls all of those together. But the core of it is that the uniquely human awareness of our mortality has a powerful influence on our behavior and life choices. That is the, the big takeaway from Becker. And I'm gonna make a potentially very controversial statement um, that is unlike humans, other animals do not have existential crises. It's only us humans that spend time contemplating our demise and worrying about whether our lives have meaning. Now, I know some of you are gonna argue with me on that and that's okay, there's room for disagreement, but for the most part, I think you get my point. Um, our death anxiety really kind of acts like an invisible hand on your shoulder, guiding, guiding us in, in our actions and our choices. Um, just maybe you could think about this way, just like Freud thought that everything came down to sex, in the world of Becker, everything comes down to death anxiety or awareness of death. Now, of course, in neither case 
in no case is one single thing the definitive answer but it's it's a really powerful influence and you'll see that as we move forward so according to becker death our death anxiety inspires the the creation of things like culture and religion that can give us markers of success and ways to belong and can also ease our anxiety associated with the awareness of death. So if I know that my culture thinks that if I get a job in police oversight, that's highly regarded, that makes me know I belong and I fit in and I'm, I'm a success by the, cult, the markers of my own cultural worldviews. And that sort of lets me know how I'm doing in this world and makes it so that I don't wanna crawl up in a, a corner and hide. I have my place in that world. Um, so this awareness of mortality drives us to invest in our own cultural worldviews and it helps us feel like we play an important part in a meaningful world. As our next speaker will explain, when we feel threatened, we hold very much tighter to those worldviews, but connecting to them helps, again, give us markers for um, how we're doing in the society and that we have a place in the society. Feeling that we're a part of something larger, something that will live on after we're gone, that reduces the anxiety and discomfort that comes from knowing that one day we will die. And this really allows us to go about our lives and function normally. In a way, culture gives us a sense of immortality. What Becker said is that each and every one of us has what he called an immortality project. We think of that a little condescending now, oh, your little project to make you feel like you're living beyond. But really it's all about what brings meaning to our life. So some of the ways immortality projects play out is you know, being a parent, writing a book, being a hero, being a terrorist, being a terrorist, being a hero, because those are the same things from your different perspectives, um, having a statue built of you. All these things can be like symbolic immortality. Um, and then also there's um, a sense of immortality that for those who invest in religious worldviews can be literal, like the afterlife, heaven, reincarnation, those uh, symbolic, um, the symbolic and those literal pieces kind of are two ways to kind of relieve that anxiety, that anxiety of, of knowing that we're gonna die, that our time is limited and we wanna have meaning, we wanna leave something behind on this earth. So those are ways of approaching it. Um, the point is that having culture reduces death anxiety by giving us opportunities for living on, whether they're literal or symbolic. And by the way, this is not to imply that protecting us from death anxiety is the only function of culture. It's simply one of the, the very powerful ones. Please know that strategies for dealing with death anxiety are not inherently negative. Uh, they're coping mechanisms that we need as mere mortals. Becker knew that we need buffers from the realities of our inevitable death. In the end, think about it this way, death anxiety is really less about the fear of dying and more about the life, fear of life without meaning. So <laughs> that is like a very quick overview of it. For those interested in diving into Becker, I recommend both his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, as well as a book he wrote called The Birth and Death of Meaning. It's, they're both really good starting points. Also, there's a documentary called Flight from Death that's an amazing resource, and it, it used to be on Hulu. I think it's on YouTube for sure. Um, I So I was introduced to all this good stuff about Ernest Becker as a student at Skidmore College in the mid 80s, as was mentioned. Um, I was drawn to it because this young and irreverent professor uh, presented it in a really compelling way. But even beyond that, when I learned about Becker, it kind of created a structure and a framework in, to fit in a lot of things I had thought and believed about human behavior and observed and never really had any way to understand better. And as I said, I've observed in my own life the power of this kind of knowing that um, if I react in a, a strong way and an immediate way to someone, there's probably a good chance that 
something about them is threatening my cultural worldviews, and that allows me to sort of process it. Uh, I think it's really important for the work we do, and I hope that you found find it powerful. Um, Professor Sheldon Solomon is our next speaker. He ended up being my favorite professor at Skidmore College, and I hope today he might be also be one of yours. And so please welcome Sheldon. Well, thank you, Deborah, and uh, welcome everybody. I was gonna say good morning or afternoon, but I don't know where you all are. So it's good to be with you uh, virtually, and uh, thanks for being here. Um, I discovered Becker's work uh, completely by accident. Uh, I was fortunate to get a job at Skidmore College in the fall of 1980, and I was staggering around in the library because I was supposed to teach a course about personality theory, and I, I was looking for Freud. And uh, I literally, it's kind of silly in retrospect, but I stumbled on this book, uh, The Birth and Death of Meaning, and truth be told, the reason I noticed it was the green splotch on the binding. You know, you'd like to think there's a, a, a real scientific reason for why you end up doing things, uh, but my life has been radically altered because I was momentarily distracted by a green splotch on the back of a book. A anyway, I yanked this book uh, off the shelf, uh, and in the first paragraph of it, uh, Ernest Becker said, I want to provide an interdisciplinary account about what makes people act the way they do. And I was like, me too. I had just finished a, a PhD and I was tired about having to wade through all kinds of jargon uh, laden ideas that were attended to be uh, microscopically focused uh, on one area of specialization. And, and here's Becker saying, I wanna understand what are the motivational underpinnings of human affairs? And, and I acknowledge at the outset that that's going to require uh, that we look at things from a variety of disciplines. So I was like, wow, uh, way to go, dude. And then I picked up the denial of death, which was sitting right next door. And in the first paragraph of that book, Becker says uh, the fear of death haunts human beings like nothing else. And he went on to describe it as the mainspring of human activity. And in my gut, I was like, wow, dude, um, I don't like what you just said, uh, but I think you're right. Uh, and uh, he then proceeds in both books to lay out in starkly simple terms what Deborah described and what I believe to be a very powerful uh, account of human affairs. In the proverbial nutshell, uh, and to repeat some of what Be uh, what Deborah told us, uh, Becker just says that in, in many ways, humans are no different than other animals. We're biologically predisposed to want to survive uh, in the service of staying alive and reproducing. And one of the things, perhaps ironically, that renders us so able to persist is our vast intelligence, which on the one hand um, allows us uh, to do things that other creatures can't, including the, uh, the, the amazing capacity to imagine something that doesn't yet exist, and then have the audacity uh, to transform our dreams uh, into reality. And, and that's like awesome, and, and Becker keeps going, and, and he just says uh, that one of the things that happens by virtue of our vast intelligence is that we realize that we're here. We're so smart that uh, we are aware of our existence and we're aware of the fact that we're aware of our existence. And for Becker, that's incredibly uplifting and it's also incredibly demoralizing. It's uplifting to be alive uh, and to know it, uh, but uh, lest ye be either a child or an idiot, if you're smart enough to know that you're alive, you're also smart enough to know that like all living things, your life is of finite duration and, and that you too uh, will someday die. And, and uh, for Becker, uh, the recognition of the inevitability of death is the most consequential event in the evolutionary history of humankind. It was an unanticipated byproduct of consciousness and, and yet, uh, what Becker hypothesizes is that 
if that's all that we thought about, I know that I'm going to die. And it's not only that you know that you're going to die, you also realize your death can come at any time for reasons that you could never anticipate or control. And that like it or not, uh, you're stuck in this very physical carcass that will inevitably uh, age and ultimately decay and die. And what Becker proposes is that we would literally be overwhelmed with debilitating existential terror in the absence of culturally constructed beliefs about reality uh, that uh, minimize or help us manage death anxiety by giving us each a sense uh, that we're valuable participants uh, in a meaningful universe. And if you're fortunate enough to perceive that you're a person of value in a world of meaning, that's what Becker calls self-esteem. And his point very simply is that whether we're aware of it or not, and mostly we are not, uh, we're able to stand up in the morning and make our way through life to the extent that we're able to maintain a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And then what he proposes on top of that is when existential concerns are aroused and when thoughts of death become more prominent in consciousness, uh, that's when we rely on our cultural worldviews and self-esteem uh, in order to fortify ourselves psychodynamically speaking. And I'll say more about that uh, in a moment. So uh, anyway, uh, I thought that these ideas uh, were strikingly uh, profound. And, and my buddies from graduate school, Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pazinski, they shared my view uh, that this was really interesting and important. For one thing, it helped us understand self-esteem. We were working on that in graduate school. Why do we need self-esteem so desperately? Well, according to Becker, we need self-esteem because it's the first line of defense. It's the bulwark uh, that keeps us from being literally inundated uh, with existential anxieties and despair. And, and the other question that we were concerned about uh, at the time uh, was how come people have such a difficult time peacefully coexisting uh, with other people who don't share their beliefs about the nature of reality. That was really uh, one of our original interests and why the third book I saw in my first week at Skidmore, Escape from Evil, another Ernest Becker book, it is so provocatively important. And, and very simply, what Becker said is, well, let's think about it. If my beliefs serve to reduce death anxiety, then the mere existence of people who hold different beliefs is potentially threatening. Because if I admit of the veracity or validity of another person's beliefs, I necessarily do so by undermining the confidence with which I subscribe to my own. So if I believe God created the earth in six days and I run into somebody, the Borneo in the South Pacific, they believe the earth was gestated out of a giant coconut, uh, well, if the pina colada people are right, then I must be wrong. And, and what Becker proposes is that whether we're aware of it or not, when we encounter folks who are different, uh, we denigrate them, we dehumanize them, and if need be, we will literally destroy and obliterate them in order to maintain our own psychological equanimity. So at the very end of Escape from Evil, uh, Becker says, I think most of the evil in the world is caused by people who self-righteously claim to be ridding the world of evil. All right, so now the question is, how do we know if any of this is true? Becker won a Pulitzer Prize, but he couldn't get a job. And, and that's where we come in. About 40 years ago, almost, Jeff and Tom and I uh, started doing experiments. First, just us, and then our students, and now a lot of great folks, including John, who you'll hear from after I I get done momentarily, but we developed some very simple paradigms that we think can provide um, evidence for Becker's claims about the role of death anxiety in human affairs, but that can also help us understand a host of phenomena that were beyond the scope of Becker's original interests, in this case, to help us think about the role of death anxiety.
in the context of police culture. Right, the paradigm we need to know most about is what's called the mortality salience paradigm. And, and uh, very simply, what we said is, all right, if your beliefs about reality reduce death anxiety, then let's ask some people to think about, about their own death. And let's ask other people to think about something unpleasant but not fatal. If it's really death that makes you cling to your worldviews, then what should happen is that if you're reminded of your own mortality, you should cling more tenaciously to your beliefs, and we should be able to determine that uh, by measuring your reaction to other individuals. Specifically, uh, when you're reminded that you're going to die, you should like other people who share your beliefs, and at the same time, you should hate and even harm uh, other people whose beliefs are merely different from your own. And, and our first experiment that we did over 30 years ago, and that I believe to be relevant for today, uh, was conducted with municipal court judges in, in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we had a small sample, I think it was 30 or so judges, and we randomly divided them in half, and we had half of the judges think about their own mortality uh, by asking them right in the middle of filling out a bunch of personality questionnaires, we just asked them to respond to two open-ended questions where they were asked to muse about their thoughts and feelings uh, about themselves dying. Uh, and after they did that, uh, we asked them to pass judgment to set bond for an alleged prostitute. And we actually had uh, documents that looked like this was an actual court case. And what we wanted to see is whether or not the judges would recommend different bonds for an alleged prostitute as a function of whether or not death was on their mind. And in the control condition, the judges prescribed an average bond of $50, which was the average in Tucson for that crime in the 1980s. However, the judges reminded of their mortality set a bond of $450, nine times as much, and not a single judge was willing to admit of the possibility when we told them what we had done that a momentary reflection on their own mortality uh, would have that much of an influence. That's a whole lot of weight on the proverbial scales of justice uh, for a subtle and not particularly conscious death reminder. Well, we have also shown it's not just that death uh, produces negative responses. If somebody does something uh, that is considered noble or heroic in your culture, well, death reminders will then make you more enthusiastic about that. So we did another study where we reminded people of death and other folks of being in pain, and then we asked them, how much reward would you give for somebody, a citizen who thwarted a bank robbery? And what we found is that $1,000 in the control condition but more than $3,000 in the more, what we call the mortality salient condition. All right, well, there's now more than 1,000 published studies uh, in this domain, and, and some of them involve asking people to think about dying in different ways. Sometimes we do this work outside the lab where we stop some people in front of a funeral parlor and other people 100 meters to either side. Sometimes we do the work in the lab, but we flash the word death so rapidly on a computer screen, like for 28 milliseconds, uh, that people have no idea uh, that death is on their minds. And I think this is very, very important because anybody who's sitting here listening to me saying, I never think about death, therefore none of these ideas are relevant for me, uh, with all due respect, you know not what's on your mind, and, and death impinges upon you in very real ways at almost all times. All right, very quickly, and then I'll turn things over to John, uh, we know, for example, that when we remind Christian participants of their mortality, they like fellow Christians more, and, and they hate Jewish people. German people reminded of their mortality sit closer to people who look German and sit further away from people uh, who look Turkish. Iranians reminded of their mortality 
are, are more supportive of suicide bombers and more willing to become one. Americans reminded of their mortality are more supportive uh, of using nuclear and chemical and biological weapons uh, against countries who pose no direct threat to us. I, to, and so I, and, uh, if we had more time, uh, what I would do is, is describe a litany of studies showing that death reminders uh, have a pervasive influence on our attitudes and behavior. Everything from who you love and hate, who you voted for in the last election, uh, what you had for lunch, why we plunder the environment, why we love shopping, uh, all of those affectations uh, are influenced by intimations uh, of mortality. All right, let's get a little bit closer though to issues surrounding uh, police behavior. And, and this is a recent study done by some um, excellent folks, I believe at Oklahoma State in 2012. And this was not done uh, with police officers. This was done uh, with uh, just college students, I believe. Uh, but what they did, it is uh, what's called the weapon effect. And the idea is to figure out why it is that when people see an ambiguous object, whether or not they will perceive it as a gun. Uh, and uh, basically what this study showed is that white people uh, reminded of their mortality uh, they were more likely to see an ambiguous object as a gun. And this was particularly true if they briefly and subliminally viewed a black face as opposed to a white one right before uh, being asked to make the judgment. And so here we have a combination of an existential threat, that being the death reminder, with a simultaneous salience of uh, uh, an outgroup, this being the face of an African-American. Right, one more study uh, very quickly, and this was one that was done in quote reality uh, by some very talented uh, researchers at Seattle University. Uh, they studied over almost two years uh, the relationship uh, between uh, violence that is perpetrated against police officers and uh, subsequent reactions by law enforcement personnel. And, and what they found is that in the aftermath uh, of uh, a law enforcement officer uh, being physically wounded or killed, uh, that there was retaliatory violence on the part uh, of law enforcement personnel. And, and I'll say no more about this, except that the folks who are doing these studies are not doing this to demonize uh, law enforcement in any way. They use a, a terror management framework uh, to propose uh, that these findings are quite understandable uh, in the context uh, of terror management theory. It can be seen uh, as efforts to restore psychological equanimity uh, when existential anxieties are aroused. I think that's, I uh, hope, uh, enough to get us to the real substance of today, and that's John's very fine work using these ideas uh, in the very setting that we're now concerned about. So, uh, John, thank you. Looking forward. Right. Thank you very much, Sheldon. So, they've done a great job kind of like setting the stage for you because it, it basically, this is kind of how I got introduced to this when I was you know, a master's student and I walked into a faculty member's office when I was at the University of Nevada and I heard a bunch of PhD students talking about terror management theory and I had absolutely kind of no clue, you know, what, what was happening there. And once I started having these discussions with them, it really started to kind of like blend into a number of things that have been happening and a number of discussions that I've been having uh, throughout my life with people. And specifically looking at these instances where you have these these events of police shootings and police violence in particular that just don't really add up in your head. And the, the first one that I can think of was, was talking uh, with, with family members who worked in law enforcement when I was a, a freshman or a sophomore in high school when Amado Diallo was killed. And he was a West African immigrant, I believe West African immigrant in New York City who was shot while he was reaching for his wallet um, by some undercover NYPD officers. 
and, and I remember having this conversation about like, how in the world does this happen? Like, like what in the world are we seeing here with this? And so that in conjunction with, with these later conversations that I ended up having with people, I start kind of putting these pieces together in my mind thinking, all right, maybe there's something to this idea that, that mortality salient crimes might be able to do something to cops. And so I start kind of looking at it in, in an effort to try and put together all of the pieces logically from, from the, the, the lens that I bring to, to my work, which is that of like kind of a, an orthodox, like a traditionally trained criminologist um, who likes to dabble in social psychology. And so what, what this, this conversation continued with my co-author of the article um, on which this is kind of based, a, a guy named Chris Donner that I went to graduate school with. And, and Chris and I basically kind of started talking about the fact that like, all right, how do these things happen at the end of the day? Can we come up with a theoretical explanation from an orthodox perspective? Because at the end of the day, these things could be considered crimes and why they're legally not is beyond the scope of, of my expertise to even kind of figure out, but like you could look at it. And so ergo, we should think that traditional criminological explanations may have something to kind of offer here. And what we found when we started kind of going through the, the litany of these things is that there's not really a good explanation that we could come up with. There was something that was there. And so in this fit of rage, when we were trying to figure this out, we, we, we thought, you know, okay, well, is this indicative of the fact that it's just a few bad apples, right? That traditional kind of explanation that people will come up with. And what we found at the end of the day is that it, it, it strains credulity to think that that may be the case simply because the number of events that are transpiring and the number of places around the U.S., it seemed to be that this was more kind of a, a broad-based, generalized effect rather than anything else. And so we started thinking more about it, and that's where the terror management theory kind of came in there. And and, and terror management theory really kind of started to fill in some of these gaps that we were seeing here. And especially when we started reading more about the other studies and about the things that Dr. Solomon talked about where you're reinforcing those worldviews for the people that are like you, and you're really kind of trying to distance yourself from those people who are not like you uh, and those sorts of issues. And we got to this idea of, well, what about the role of police culture? And police culture is one of these things that's it's critically important for understanding policing because it dictates a lot of what happens. It dictates a lot of the, the actions that police take because the, the culture is their worldview through which they view the world, right? And so some of these things, right, like they have a very strong us versus them mentality, right? And so you'll frequently see or hear cops talk about the fact that, right, in God we trust, all others we run through NCIC. And NCIC is the National Crime Information Computer, right? So they're basically like, they're not going to trust you until they're told that you're you're safe, if you will, for them. And that us versus them is exactly what, what Sheldon was just talking about there with like the Iranians compared to the Americans talking about these different things in that way, where you have these in-groups and these out-groups. Another thing that came out is that, that when we start looking at this is that you see secrecy is this predominant theme that is there um, in, in the police culture. And the last issue that's there is this idea that you have this perception of dangerousness and this perception of dangerousness kind of fades around and, and kind of pervades everything that happens in the police culture in the idea that they need to be protected from these things that, that the people are going to do to them. And so it kind of just like naturally begs this question, like does terror management theory kind of fill in these gaps for us to get there? And that's what we started trying to do is develop a theoretical uh, model for this here. And there's a, a number of different ways that this works and we integrated it with a traditional criminological theory that explains uh, police culture and the formation of police culture pretty well. And it's, it's social learning theory. And social learning theory, if you think about it, basically is going to say that your definitions at the end of the day, so your kind of attitudinal definitions are going to be either favorable or unfavorable towards offending in a particular environment. And basically when I have an excess of definitions that are favorable to violating the law as compared to not, I'm going to do it um, and vice versa. But it works kind of broader across the perspective other than that. But it says that these definitions are formed through differential reinforcement, imitation and uh, differential associations. And the differential associations is basically just who you hang out with is gonna be the people that are gonna affect your definitions at the end of the day, right? Most of us, you know, heard those kind of adages from our parents that they didn't want us hanging around with those kids that were trouble because less they wear, they, they rub off on us, right? Um, but when you start thinking about it in the context of policing and police culture, 
cops disproportionately socialize with and almost exclusively socialize with people that are either in law enforcement or people who are kind of like on the peripheries of law enforcement in various capacities. It, it's, it's, it's rare that they're going to have these kind of friendships that, that predominate outward. And then the, the paramilitaristic model that predominates most policing and especially police training, especially of new recruits, is where you're going to start seeing this imitation and the differential reinforcements playing a role. Because in order to keep your job, in order to successfully negotiate training, in order to receive these uh, you know, kind of accolades from your peers and from the organization, you have to behave in certain ways. And so the, the idea is here, what ways do I need to behave in in order to do that? And that's where you start seeing these ideas of, you know, you need to be masculine, you need to be secret, you need to be, you need to be confronting danger, you need to do all of these different things that are kind of coming up with um, in there. And, and so we start looking at the, these ideas that are coming down uh, in here to kind of start putting it together. And we find that there's this natural link whereby I have these definitions of here's what I need to do. I have a pretty clear idea and there's a pretty clear basis of literature to talk about how these attitudes and how these definitions are formed. And we, we seem to understand that pretty clearly, although to, to, to the point that, that some people would make is that there's not this monolithic, there's not a singular police culture, if you will. There, there's a predominant police culture, but even within that, there's various kinds of subcultures. And, and some people are talking about that as like the warrior versus guardian mentality has been the, the, the most recent kind of uh, discussion of this that, that's kind of come out in here. But then when you start to see these things kind of fall to the end, you see, okay, the definitions don't necessarily explain it because one of the things that, that cops say is that, you know, you need to do right. That's one of those elements of, of police culture. And so we were like, okay, how does this, how does the mortality salience crime play into this? And it was exactly the fact that when a police officer is attacked, killed, or maimed by another in close spatial or temporal proximity, we thought, okay, these are going to be those events that are going to be most likely to influence an officer's perceptions and an officer's behavior. Because one of the things that we know is that police absolutely have a non-zero probability of being killed, hurt, injured, or maimed every day when they go on the job. But we also know that police overestimate what that effect actually is and how different and how differential that is is still kind of one of those questions that's open for empirical debate. Um, on a number of ways, uh, a number of levels. But we know that these things are true that are there. And, but when police are reminded about the fact that these things could happen to them, all of a sudden you start to see the, 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 these events that are happening here. And so you start to see in, in these different instances uh, around the country uh, of things that, are, uh, that happen in close spatial and temporal proximity to what's happening. And, and one of my I don't want to say favorite because it, it sounds terrible to say it that way, but the percent, perhaps the quintessential example of this is Tamir Rice, who was killed in Cleveland, Ohio, the 12 year old boy who was killed in the park uh, when the police called and said, or were called and said, you know, hey, we think that somebody has a gun um, and, and, you know, it looks like it's a toy gun. And, and notwithstanding the officer's tactical failures of, of driving up directly next to, to somebody who, who was uh, purportedly armed at that point, right? One of the things that we know is that two or three days before that uh, in Akron, which is I think about 100 miles away, there was an officer who was severely hit or injured or killed as a result of gunfire. And it was one of those events that was definitely kind of transmitted through the, the gossip sphere that is uh, the, the police department. And so it, it was likely that these things were either predominantly on these officers' minds when they were in this, or as Sheldon said, right, they might not have even realized that it was there, but because of these discussions that they were having, all of a sudden, you know, here we are, we roll up to it, and I'm going to now make a, a decision in a few short seconds that's going to instrumentally change that kid's life, the community's life and even the national conversation that we're having about kind of police violence um, in these ways. And so we, we, we started to find this kind of strong evidence that's there for it. Um, the problem that we have is that these are kind of, in terms of the, the amount of evidence that I can tell you that we have that's here, it's fairly weak because we have never been able to directly test this. We have tried multiple times to ask police administrators, you know, hey, would you let us, you know, run these types of, of uh, of experiments with your cops and, and see how things work. 
and understandably so, you know, police administrators become a little concerned about us potentially rooting around in their officers' heads and, and evoking something that, that otherwise wouldn't be there. And so we haven't ever been able to directly test it. Um, if, if a selfless plug, right? If anybody, you know, has an agency that they're willing to do this with, we're, we're absolutely willing to, to come in. We've got the protocol. We've got the, the entire thing kind of developed there. We just need a place to do it um, in, in that way. But so when we started thinking about, okay, well, what are the implications of this? It starts to kind of bring in a number of other pieces to the puzzle um, that we see here. And, and one of the first is that, right, I think that, that everybody would argue that we can do better and we should do better, right? Especially when you start seeing some of the, the shootings of unarmed people that are happening that are disproportionately people of color. Um, it, it, we can and we should be do, do better, right? Um, the police, many police executives, many police officers and the community especially want to see these things change, but they're just not entirely sure how to go about changing them because they're not sure where what, what the, the source of the, the problem is. And one of the things that we've seen is that training is going to be one of those things that is a very strong indicator of things that could potentially need to be changed because right now what happens is that in police training, even in the academy, they're constantly reinforcing this idea of dangerousness and they're constantly reinforcing th this idea that, you know, you gotta be out, you gotta be on the lookout for, for the unexpected. And it's never the unexpected that, that, you know, it's the female perpetrator in a male female relationship who is the, the perpetrator of intimate partner violence. It's always the fact that, you know, somebody's going to produce a waist, a gun from their waistband or 30 guns hidden underneath, you know, a t-shirt and jeans type of thing um, th that are coming out in, in terms of like trying to get officers uh, to think about these things. And so officers end up kind of creating these mental heuristics, right? These mental shortcuts in their head about how to deal with these, these situations based off of this kind of repetitive training to danger such that we think that when they get these mortality salience crimes and they're reminded of it, they end up resorting to those things as a byproduct of the fact that they're trying to reaffirm their cultural worldview, but it's also the easiest thing for their brain to do in the process of kind of pushing along here with this. And this has become especially concerning in, in recent years um, with the, the rise and the, the really kind of like propagation of warrior training that has started happening um, around the country whereby officers are taught, you know, officer survival skills, right? That essentially like you need to learn these skill sets to be able to survive these ambushes and, and, and things like that. And to be fair, there certainly have been these incidences uh, of, of ambushes upon officers, such as you saw in the CC's Pizza um, in Las Vegas a couple of years ago, where the officers were sitting and eating lunch. And there was a gentleman who decided that he was going to kill the police. And he walked in and he almost contact shot these officers in the head, right? Like there was literally nothing that they could do. They had they had no contact with him by any stretch of the imagination. He had just made that decision and, and from there he was gonna go. And this training is purportedly designed to try and help people uh, recognize, develop the situational awareness to overcome these limitations in that way. But the thing that it's doing is it's constantly reinforcing that idea of dangerousness and constantly reinforcing and strengthening um, that, that idea that, that we see um, coming out uh, of these mortality salience crimes that are here. Um, another thing that we're, we're starting to see here, and, and we, we, we've been talking about this more recently in, in terms of another uh, project that we're working on, is we're not sure whether or not this police culture and, and these kind of, especially some of the other characteristics that are associated with it, um, like, like Sheldon had talked about, right, like authoritarianism and, and things like that that are these personality traits that are also very common in cops and they predominate the, the, the police culture. But we're not sure whether these things are actually imported into policing, meaning that we select people who have these types of, of beliefs, or whether or not they're trained in the, the socialization process or both. And so we're starting to do some work in that, trying to look at that um, with it. And with that, I think I will I'll let the rest lie because the rest is minutia in my notes that I wrote um, for this. And with that, I think I'll kick it back over to Brian to, to open up the question and answers.
All right. Well, uh, thank you, John. And also thank you, Sheldon. And thank you, Deborah, who has magically reappeared on my screen. Um, so I want to I want to first invite the audience. So um, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with this wonderful format, but there is a way that you can ask questions. So there's a little box and you can put questions in there. I think uh, we've only gotten a couple in. So I'm going to kick it off by asking a couple of questions myself and then the questions will flow in and we will hear from the attendees here with us on the webinar. So um, I guess just first, you know, Deborah, if I can start with you, can you say a little bit about while you were in your years at OLEO, at the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, how this understanding affected your work, both looking at investigations, but also around policy? Thank you, Brian. Um, I. <laughs> So I would say one of the areas that most informed was in training. And <clears throat> just last week, I was at a de-escalation training where numerous videos were used that showed officers getting killed uh, because of maybe some faulty tactics or ambushes or other things. And I just really thought deeply about how that would affect everything else that was being taught that day and how, you know, so that was something I'm eager to sort of provide feedback on to the trainers. Um, and then in the other area is just evaluating officer involved shootings and trying to figure out um, what causes officers to react in a particular moment in a particular way um and uh really wondering also about what happens with respect to death anxiety as far as um having an officer who was involved in one shooting and we know there's some evidence that you might be more likely to be in another shooting so in some ways, Brian, I would say it, it lifts up more questions than it gives answers to, but this is a lens I find very helpful um, in terms of understanding police behavior and particularly the culture where the hypervigilance, the constantly thinking they might die when really there are at least 15 other professions that are more dangerous and that that we don't think about in the same way. So there's a lot there, but um, the lens has served me well, I will say that. All right, great, thank you, Deborah. And and actually, you 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 kind of lead me right into a question I had for John, um, which is, I guess, you know, can you just maybe say a little bit more, John, about this issue of police training? And uh, I think probably most of the people on this webinar know that part of traditional police training is you watch video after video of officers being killed, what Deborah just described. And so how, how so can you build on what Deborah just talked about and from your research and what you've seen working with police and policing and how, again, thinking about our audience and civilian oversight largely, but not exclusively, we certainly have police officers and others. What what does this tell us and what, what can we do with this to be making positive change? Well, the first thing that I think that I would say is that uh, listening to Deborah talk about that, right? Think about the disjuncture in the logic that's here, right? And, and, and I, I think she alluded to this earlier when her and I were talking about it is that you're going to a de-escalation training, which is supposed to show people that there are methods that you can use in order to reduce the likelihood that you're going to use force, right? Whether those are tactical things in terms of maintaining space or whether or not they're the conversational elements and the active listening skills, all of that is great. And the fact that the, the those same type of videos kind of impact that, that environment or, or enter into that environment and basically kind of push that dialogue in the same way speaks to how ingrained these things are within policing. Um, it, it's really interesting to me that, that, that we can teach officers about how dangerous their profession is through those types of videos and we can motivate their behavior this way, I would argue in a deleterious manner, but we still see that almost as many officers every year are killed in automobile accidents. And many of those are because they're not wearing seat belts, but we can't seem to convince officers to wear their seat belts with the same degree of, of, of certainty that we can convince them of this dangerous thing. And so it kind of speaks into that narrative that's there. And I'm not entirely sure, Brian, that I was responsive to your question, but like yeah. there, there's definitely a, a link up of training that's here. And I think especially from the, the, oversight perspective right thinking about this in terms of trying to drive these things home for the the NACL audience 
the other effects that come out of this make it a lot more difficult to do these things because, right, assuming that police culture exists, right, let's take that as kind of the, the given that is there. I don't know that anybody would argue that, but the exact elements of it, people are going to, you know, debate. And it's not a negative thing and it's not unique to policing. Everybody has their own. But one of them is this idea of that us versus them, the secrecy thing, and especially the kind of like separation and the mistrust between line staff and uh, managerial staff who they seem as being who they see as being uh, arbitrary and punishment centered, right? <laughs> That's going to make it so that people are less willing to cooperate with these investigations and report these things in the same way because they're like these mortality salience crimes are going to be reinforcing that cultural belief of the fact that they need to kind of like adhere to the the blue wall, uh, if you will, in that way. Great. All right. No, thank you. That's really helpful, John. And that. Let me ask a question of Sheldon, and then I think we can I think we can open it up. Well, we've got to see questions are coming in. So um, this is kind of a big question. So you know, answer it to the extent that it makes sense, Sheldon, please. But really, just thinking about the moment we're in, right? We're living in a pandemic where every day we're reminded about how many people have died—500,000 people in this country alone—and we're living through. Um, a relatively unprecedented reckoning around issues of racial justice, around policing. And so I just want, you know, what what could you tell us about the impact of this, this broader idea on the tension around policing issues, what we're facing, and again, maybe an idea about you know, how we build on this in a positive way to move forward in a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Brad. Um, I'll give you my silly stock answer if I could answer that. You know, I'd be chugging rum out of a coconut on a beach with my Nobel Prize, but uh, let it suffice to say, and we have mused about this, to state the obvious, the pandemic um, is a pervasive reminder of death, both explicitly and implicitly. And so even folks who uh, would argue I'm not really thinking about it, uh, I would submit that death is everywhere. Uh, and uh, consistent with Becker's ideas, um, what one should find um, is a magnification of pre-existing uh, political and ethical sensibilities. Uh, and so on the one hand, um, there's no doubt that hate crimes are up. Uh, uh, there's no doubt uh, that atrocities committed against people of color are up and there's no doubt uh, that political polarization um, has been magnified uh, as a result and i don't mean this to be a political discussion but i would insist that uh, one of the most serious deficiencies of the trump administration was never bothering to try to get americans uh, to recognize their commonality the hallmark uh, of catastrophe from a terror management point of view is the division between us and them. We are hardwired to condemn and dehumanize uh, the other. Uh, and that's bad enough with humanity in general, but we've reduced America to two non-overlapping distributions. And I would insist that uh, there um, is not um, equal blame to uh, dispense in that regard. I thought, so what we've got is uh, folks that lean towards being fascists have become more fascistic and there's no shortage of that and folks that lean the other way uh, have gone in that direction there's been tremendous outpouring uh, of sympathy and direct aid to other folks i would even submit as awkward as this may sound uh, that some of the current attention by white Americans to the structural inequalities and the pervasively racist aspect of uh, America, um, which like it or not, it's part of the American worldview. Some folks have said, you know what? Uh, we need to step back and to work on that. We, we haven't recovered from uh, slavery or the civil war. And, and uh, we just need to do that. And, and so again, uh, uh, I'm not trying to be provocative here, although I suspect that I am. Uh, I, I think about when George Floyd uh, was exterminated by the police. And what I think is that 
had we not been in a pandemic, that would have caused the 36 hours or so of distress. And then it's back to Twitter and, and Amazon Prime. Maybe the pandemic has had the effect for some uh, of getting us to take a step back and to fortify our commitment uh, to what might be seen as more progressive values. And so I talked too long, but I think the <laughs> pandemic is a death reminder. And, and apropos of them, uh, it will magnify all, all prior inclinations. Great question, Brian. Brian, can I ask a question Thank kind you. of following up on that? Uh, very briefly, because I want to get the, the big audience. Oh, no, yeah. I, I'm just curious, Sheldon and Deborah, especially since you guys know Becker's work. And normally with the stimuli, you get to a point where you're not, it's not having the same intended effect anymore. Like there becomes like a saturation. Do we run that risk? Like with, with Becker describing it in this way, because, you know, 500,000 people dead is, is almost in con it's hard to kind of imagine. And I'd never thought about it in the way that, that Sheldon just described it, but I just wonder like, at what point do people start becoming numb to that prime? Um, yeah, they are. So this is a story for another time and another great <laughs> another webinar. 25% <laughs> uh, or so Mas or Manos of Americans have dissociative symptoms that are characteristic of PTSD. So I think some are already uh, at the saturation point. So uh, very good and important question. Well, all right, thank you. And I know, uh, I, I want to say so much, but it's not my job today. So I will. I want to thank you all for this so far. And Cami is back to bring us some questions from the audience. And um, if if appropriate, I will help field them to one or more of you, so we can keep it flowing. So. And Cami, I, I, it's that famous phrase: "You're on mute." Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. We do have quite a few questions from the audience. So um, why don't we start with this one? So does training that tries to break down divides between in and out groups, such as robust scenario-based implicit bias training, have much influence on the effect of mortality salience and increasing violence against out group members? Well, let's see, is that a question for John, Sheldon, both? Or Let's start with John. Uh, so I'm gonna to defer to Sheldon here for this, but I can't answer it specifically, but because I don't know off the top of my head, but thinking about the way that the theoretical development of it would work and looking at this idea of like the implicit bias trainings and other things like that that are out there, the more that you could break down those differentiations between the us and the them in that way, the easier it's going to be to, to kind of bring people together or the less extreme that you may see those shifts when you do have a mortality salience prime would be what, what I would argue. I want to just throw in real quick on that one that I think it's important to be thoughtful about who your actors are in your role training. Um, to that end, just for example, for a bunch of reasons, but usually they use one another as role players. So they're basically seeing friends who are white people, et cetera. And to diversify that, I think could be impactful. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And then Sheldon, anything? Yeah, yeah. Just real quickly, I think here's where some of the, I hope research might come in. Deborah, you'll remember uh, pre-pandemic when we were hoping uh, to do studies on uh, police trainees in King County. And we wanted to replicate the weapons uh, bias study. And, and uh, the, the trainees, we were gonna do it on the actual rifle range to see if death reminders made them more likely to perceive an ambiguous object as a gun. And the point here, again, is not to denigrate, it's to illuminate. Uh, the hope would be that uh, the and the the sheriff was great. He wanted us to do this because if we could show um, law enforcement personnel, look, this is how humans behave, and you being human, this is how you behave. Uh, we were talking before uh, we got on today about a talented student. I'm working with a PhD student in criminal justice at John Jay University, and. She wants to show that the blue wall gets uh, reinforced when death is on officers' minds to the extent that they subscribe to a warrior mentality, but not a guardian one. Uh, and this gets back to, again, the idea is to just learn as much as we can about the parameters 
uh, that foster the kinds of behaviors uh, that we would consider to be desirable and pro-social and to hope that we could subsequently work them into the trainings. Great, all right, thank you all. It was very, very helpful and a great question. Um, so, Cami, what, what else do you have for us? Next, um, the very discussion of death anxiety provokes death anxiety. In order for these ideas to be effective with police, how do you approach the discussion at all so that there is some measure of curiosity? Yeah, that's a, um, I'm not even sure who to turn that question over to. So well, I'll start with you, Deborah. Well, I'll say a couple of things. One, John put out the interest earlier in have, working with departments who might be willing to study this. And I wanted to jump in and said, but don't tell them what you're studying. Yes. <laughs> because as soon as you tell them what you're studying, then um, it's you've muddied the waters, right? Um, so in general, what I've learned through this work is anytime you're talking to people and there might be strife or difference, Focusing in and starting on shared values is a really good place to go. And um, that's identifying those. I mean, that's the value, quite honestly, of small talk and knowing each other. Um, it's a, a curse and a plus of working in, in police oversight, I think. You, <laughs> you get to know people and then you have to kind of deal with, with those differences. So. Um, so starting from a place of shared values, discovering them and emphasizing them, and also helping people see a future, see beyond, that's also an important element on that. But I'll let the experts weigh in beyond that. Well, I will just say you are also an expert, Deborah, but uh, but let's you know, let's turn let's ask John and Sheldon to weigh in. <laughs> And Sheldon, I'll let you go first because it, it, it's a point well taken about the fact that you can't talk about death but thinking about death, right? Like, it's don't think about a big pink elephant, right? Like, it's the first thing that kind of comes to your mind as a priming effect. And I don't know how you broach that conversation in that way. So I, I'll let you go. Yeah, a, a good point. And uh, all I can do is to blubber vaguely about the importance uh, of, uh, as Deborah put it, uh, establishing. Um, there, there are shared values, I would add to that, establishing uh, that there is shared identity. Uh, and, um, and a tough one, um, which is to establish uh, lines of communication based on a non-hierarchical sense of mutual respect, which is almost impossible. Um, in a world uh, where intelligence and knowledge uh, has been denigrated as a fatal character flaw. But be that as it may, uh, the, the point is, is that uh, when I come into these environments, I, I could see uh, the look of unmitigated horror uh, on people's faces. And it can't be my appearance because I look like a prison inmate. I, I was thrown out of uh, the maximum security prison in New York in the 1980s for looking too much like an inmate. The assumption uh, is that I'm a professor uh, and therefore have a patronizing and condescending view of anybody who's not. And so that, um, and that already creates difficulties in terms of establishing the kind of rapport that, as you know, is useful. Um, and um, what I found uh, was um, it's really, it's the small talk and chit chat uh, that um, hopefully uh, enables folks to get to the point where we can enter what the dead Russian dude of Lev Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development. English translation, um, if we're gonna make any headway with any constituency, we have to engage them. Uh, in ways that they can readily appreciate. And this is tough for an academic because we measure our wit in terms of the average number of syllables in each of the words that we choose to deploy, <laughs> but that tends to have a tremendously adverse effect. Um, and, and the other thing I would say, and again, I think maybe all these things are obvious, but um, 
I think a lot of this is going to be best done uh, at a very local level in an ideal universe where, again, there's a communal overlap between the law enforcement folks and other folks uh, in the community. Um, I, I, I live on a block, um, I live on a small block in a rural town, but three of my neighbors uh, are police officers, multi-generational. And, and, you know, I'm known as kind of some Woodstock throwback, but uh, over the years, I, I've had interactions, uh, you know, in a quasi-training setting where we're talking to folks. And I just think that the fact that we have a little bit of a basis uh, that transcends the boundaries of that particular interaction can be useful. Brian, I know you want to move on, but I just really quickly want to throw in that the Ernest Becker Foundation's brilliant Lila Rothschild reminded me that research has shown that if you remind people of pro-social values that are most part of most of our worldviews, such as tolerance, empathy and compassion, then even after death reminders, they can remain more open. So that's another key, you know, shared values as far as tolerance, tolerance empathy and compassion, which are pro-social views. Thank yeah, you. and I'm going to uh, run the risk of invading again. Uh, Lila, good point. The other thing we know from our research is that if you start off by saying, we call it a common humanity prime, if the first thing out of your mouth is, look, we have more in common than we are different. Afterwards, if you remind people that they're going to die, they do not respond defensively. That's why the key point here may ultimately be the capacity to overcome uh, what are ultimately arbitrary differences uh, and to restore a superordinate sense of commonality. This is not to homogenize us uh, into uh, conforming an identical entity so much as to stipulate at the outset that we're all in the boat together. All right. So well, thank you. Thank you all. And um, again, not no time to comment, but I will just say that I, it's always good to be reminded that change happens off, most often in places where we connect with our common humanity as opposed to places where we're confronting and attacking, even though sometimes you have to do that. So thank you all. Uh, Cammie, back to you. I know we have a number of questions and we're, we're, we're working through them, so. Yes, um, so the next one is, how does death anxiety compare with the death drive? Could these impact officer behavior in different ways? For example, hypervigilance versus uh, risk taking. So once again, I feel like I'm failing in my role. I'm going to give this one to John and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm trying to grasp the death drive here. If somebody can fill that gap for me, because I think I know what it is, but I think I don't want to step all over it being wrong. Um, if by death drive, you're referring to Freud's idea of a, a death instinct, um, Becker repudiates that notion, uh, th and this is a long story, and maybe we can communicate um, uh, uh, outside of the boundaries of the, of the webinar, but um, his view uh, is, the, ironically, that it was Freud's own death anxiety that made him posit uh, a death drive. Um, so from Becker's perspective, um, there just is death anxiety uh, and, and no intrinsic desire uh, for us to cease. Okay, I, I, I like that makes sense. I appreciate it. Um, I, all right, Cammie, next question. Okay. <laughs> um, the next question is, Military cultures share many of the characteristics that were described for police culture, yet it does not seem to have the same effects in creating a thin green wall that might explain, what might explain this difference? Hmm. Okay, um, well, I wanna answer that one, but I'm not going to, so I'm gonna start with Sheldon. <laughs> um, I pass. Uh, if you have insights, Brian, um, <laughs> Please. Okay. Well, let me just say a little bit, and then because I'm not here to be the expert, you know, I, I think part of it is 
and that, that others can react to this, hopefully, is sort of the difference between uh, the military as an institution that is sort of completely separated from society in most ways, is told that they're not part of society, they really are warriors, they live in a separate universe, they have separate systems, they eat separate places, they take their families out of regular society and bring them with them, and they are there to meet the goal, meet the mission. Law enforcement has borrowed many, many things from the military and the paramilitary model, but, but they're different. They are not completely separated from society. They're actually embedded within society. So I think there's, there's some real distinctions about that framing. And so if you have a military where you are told and you are literally separate, it's very different from when you're completely integrated in society but you're trying to figure out, you're trying to develop this sense of being separated, that we are different, we are warriors, we are not part of, we are separate from. So I, I wonder if that has, so discuss. And Brian, I think that you, you may be, I, I think it, there, there's something there because that's kind of where I was gonna go with it. But also I wonder if this is a false equivalency or not, because mm -hmm. when you think about the way that military training goes, you think about the, the, the various facets of these things, that happen here, you see the same types of reactions. It's just in a different environment that hasn't been studied kind of nearly as well, I don't think, because the military tends to be very insular about who they'll let study them um, unless you're kind of invited in for it. But thinking about uh, friends, colleagues, family members, um, and different depictions of what happens in the military, it's very much kind of that same way, right? When one of my former students, when I was at the University of Illinois at Chicago was a judge advocate general attorney, and he used to be responsible for investigating sexual assault claims um, in the Great Lakes region. And he had a hell of a time getting anybody to talk to him during the course of those things, unless there was a direct order that was issued. And because that direct order was issued, at that point there became legal peril for them not cooperating because they didn't have the same rights, like the same Garrity rights, right, that you would call it in policing when you, when you think about like not having to testify against yourself um, in, in, the, in the kind of criminal manner because the criminal and the administrative get blended in that capacity there. I would also throw in that um, typically the military sees its enemies as foreign, you know, they go abroad and fight abroad and the enemy of police, if they have that concept, is right here at home and they're making judgments based on physical appearance and other things that kind of relate to that. Um, and also I think often military, rightly or wrongly, feel like um, there, I guess it's, this is true of both, but it's a righteous cause, it's heroic, et cetera, and we kind of feed into that as well. And even from this mortality salience prime kind of stuff like that, like Deborah's talking about here, right? Killing a member of ISIS, if you kill a member of ISIS unwarrantedly or against the rules of engagement for it, it's not likely going to be picked up by the media because that is an other that is there. Whereas in the in the United States, right, like it's an American or an American citizen typically is the, the way that you would think about it, which is going to evoke the most outrage um, for, from people in, in the U.S. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you all. Um, I know more questions, so because yes. we've got about 13 minutes left, so we can yes. do a few more, a couple more at least. Um, do you think the contact hypothesis, the idea that intergroup contact under appropriate conditions can effectively reduce prejudice between majority and minority group members, has potential for reducing the number of violent contacts between police and minorities if implemented as a practice in the police department? For example, officers are required to give service hours to minority communities. So I know that, do you want to go ahead, Sheldon? No, you talk. Okay, let's okay. do John and then Sheldon and Deborah, if you want to jump in too, that's great. So, so, so John? I'll keep mine, mine succinct, right? Hopefully. Uh, I know that the city of Oakland, California has started doing that where they bring in people who have had historically kind of strained relationships with the police to basically kind of talk to their recruits um, from, from the beginning kind of in the academy to basically say, you know, when you're interacting with me, here's what I see and here's kind of my experience that they have in that capacity. And so you, you start to kind of break down those barriers to understand. It's not that you are angry or pissed off or, or, or upset with something that I've done. It's a historical legacy that I kind of bring to the table when I interact with you. And, and this has been kind of a, a, a persistent theme that's existed within 
kind of the broader community policing literature is that the closer you can get the police to the communities they serve, the yeah. better off you are, right? You see things with, with foot patrols don't make sense in a, a number of American uh, cities because of you know how they're set up, but in places where it's appropriate, you see that deploying foot patrols actually improves the relationship between the police and the community, irrespective of whether or not you actually see an appreciable decline in crime um, in those areas. And so the, I think that it can be beneficial from, from a very kind of applied perspective in that way. Okay, Sheldon? Yeah, uh, agreed. Uh, just on the egghead research front, um, you know, Elliot Aronson of yesteryear uh, called it the jigsaw uh, technique. And the idea is that contact is um, imperative. But again, like a jigsaw puzzle, it, it works best when people are in a place where they're on equal footing, engaged in an activity where everybody's input is necessary. And so it's not enough to be in the same room. Um, and this is an anecdote, but I, I told you before I, I, I got kicked out of maximum security prison, um, I taught um, in a program, ironically, Skidmore College had a program called University Without Walls, <laughs> where we taught in the maximum security prison. But uh, anyway, we went up to the prison to teach the uh, inmates, uh, and uh, evidently there was, uh, right before I got there, uh, they were um, trying, they were experimenting uh, with some of the guards uh, going to class to get educated along with the prisoners. Wow. And the idea was twofold. One is, is that there was some resentment on the part of the guards that the inmates were getting a Skidmore education and not having to pay for it, to which the Skidmoreans evidently said, yeah, that's good, you're right. So why don't we uh, make this opportunity more widely available? And then the other thought was, uh, here's an environment, the classroom, that is equally alien to both the inmates as well as the guards. And it was, in theory, a, a, a very a, a promising way to maybe uh, foster uh, these kinds of connections. Uh, and um, again, long story, but I heard that uh, that it, it was scuttled in part because it was working too well. Yeah. That, that uh, the folks who worked at the prison, uh, largely rural white guys, um, realized that the largely urban people of color that they had denounced as subhuman individuals who rarely transcend the monosyllabic utterance, that they in fact uh, were holding their own and doing better in classes. Uh, and that created not, not resentment, it created respect. And that was dangerous in a prison system that was based on the need to dehumanize and disrespect. So in my first week of training uh, to go into the prison, you know, I was taught, don't look at these folks, don't talk to them, they're animals. Uh, and so, and this is not uh, about the days of yesteryear. The, the point though is, is that I think there's a lot of situations uh, that can be constructed or constructed rather, uh, where we may be able to foster the, the, these kinds of direct contacts. I, I don't see how we're gonna be able to pull this off in the long run without a big dose of that. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Deborah, did you did you have anything you wanted to add to this one? Okay, great. All right, so I, you know, it's always that balance between trying to get more comment and trying to get more questions in, but I, I know we have, Let's do another question and see if we have time for one after that. So, okay. uh, Cami, what else do you have for us? So this is more of a clarifying question. So um, it's still not clear to me how death anxiety um, that each and every one of us feels to some extent affects the police culture as a whole. Are you saying that the police training in and of itself is to blame for the particular reactive behaviors? No, so the police culture itself is it's it's taking it and it's imprinting it upon the individual officer and the individual officer when he or she is interacting with the public it's the mortality salience prime and that kind of thought of death at that point 
that's then going to influence his or her actions in a particular place. And I, I can't explain, right? Like, I, I don't know, and, and maybe Sheldon will have something or Deborah will have something that, that, that's smarter here, but I can't explain why you would expect to see this in some people more extreme than others with the, the, the difference being that it's kind of a roulette wheel of the types of situations that you get sent to. So you may, it may be affecting everybody equally, but you may not be in a situation to see a shooting uh, you might not as be equally as in in, a, in that situation to see a shooting. So Sheldon, it looks like you wanted to weigh in too. Uh, uh, again, a very fine question that may have to persist uh, uh, afterwards because what I believe we are saying is that there is a police culture, just like there's a yoga culture and a vegan culture and, and supporters of President Trump and Bernie culture. Uh, and. Uh, that uh, when existential anxieties are aroused, the argument is that uh, people will embrace, whether they're aware of it or not, the values that are intrinsic to the social roles that uh, they inhabit uh, in the context uh, of that culture. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that uh, there are individual differences with regard to how reactive people are. Uh, when intimations of mortality are in the air. And it's hard to talk about these without sounding judgmental, but this is not the case. But people who identify as politically conservative, who are disproportionately represented uh, in the law enforcement communities, they are known to have higher levels of death anxiety. They are known to be, relatively speaking, intolerant to ambiguity. And, and and the reason I say that I don't mean this as an indictment of anyone or anything is that you don't choose your political orientation. It has a heritability quotient that uh, suggests that it's fundamentally inherited. And, and that in turn, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, raises the possibility that we need everybody across the political spectrum uh, in the human family uh, we just need everybody to be in the same family. Uh, we would be dead in seconds if everybody was liberal, uh, and we would be dead in seconds if everybody was conservative. Uh, and uh, But the, back to the general point here, and, and that's that uh, there are individual differences with regard to the propensity to experience death anxiety. Those in turn uh, affect the way that we respond. Uh, uh, so um, insecurely attached people, I'm psychobabbling now, when you remind them that they're going to die, uh, they're more likely to hate somebody who's different. A securely attached individual reminded of their mortality is more likely to reaffirm their connection with their significant others. All right Now note, they're both reacting defensively uh, but when you tell your significant other that you love them even more, that's more conducive to domestic and foreign tranquility uh, than when you demonize and denigrate someone who's different. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you all. So I'm tempted to try squeezing one more question, but I know we, we're a couple minutes before we're supposed to wrap up. So um, at the risk of not getting more content in, um, I think we should pause this and, because I know Cami has to do a little bit of closing. So I really just want to thank all of you, Professor Solomon, Professor Mascali, and Director Jacobs. I'm going to call you that because I want to give you a title too. Um, but seriously, this has been such a fascinating session. The questions we got were great. The information you have is amazing. Um, I know there's more to come. And I really just thank you all for the work that you do and helping us do the work that we do a little bit better. So, um, and again, thank you, Deborah, for proposing this. Yeah, and um, the Ernest Becker website has a bunch of resources. We're all individually available. Um, if you have questions or wanna pursue something in this conversation and also check out in the Seattle Times, I published an op-ed on this very topic a couple months ago that might be a useful resource as well, so. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So, Cami, thank you for all of your work to make this happen. And uh, close us out, please. <laughs> well, uh, first, let me follow up on what Deborah said. Um, we will do a follow up email to, to all of the registrants and we'll include some links to the Ernest Becker Foundation and some other resources 
so that you have those along with the recording of the webinar. So, and with that, I just wanna thank all of you today for bringing your valuable perspective and knowledge to us. I also wanna thank, as did Brian, um, you, Deborah, for bringing this idea to us and giving us the opportunity to partner with the Ernest Becker Foundation on, on this webinar. Uh, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank everyone out in the audience today for taking time out of their day to be with us. So registration will be soon, will soon be live for the next three webinars in this year's series. Events in April, May, and June will take on the topics of providing oversight of police uh, protest policing, truth and reconciliation, and the role of supervisors in organizational change. It has been a pleasure being with all of you today, and I look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you.